recording. This is the Open Global Mind weekly community call on Thursday, September 7th, 2023. We're going to pick up where we were two weeks ago, talking about uh, models and theories of collapse and reconstruction or revitalization. Um, let me turn on the subtitles. Good. And um, good. And I'm 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 interested in uh, any feedback on the call two weeks ago for those of us who were on the call two weeks ago. Uh, so we can maybe do a little ranging for uh, where we are and what's up. Thoughts? I'm interested in having more people here. That would be good. Well, people are slowly showing up, so it's good. Matt, thanks for joining us. What is your location on the globe? I am uh, about an hour outside New York City. Oh, cool. Good to see you. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. Um, Gil, any... Uh, I, know that, I know that we... At the end of the call two weeks ago, I think a bunch of us were pretty jazzed with where we were pointing and uh, a little flooded by too much info and um, not enough structure on the info and maybe just slowing things down a little bit. Uh, at least that's my take. Ken, go ahead. Oh, I thought I saw Ken about to speak. Actually, he's look, moving to a place where he can speak without interrupting people around him. No, he's moving to receive radiation from the sun. I was turning off my Bose sound dock, which was across the room where all of the sound was coming out of instead of my headphones. And I didn't think my wife needed to hear our conversation. So. Ah, perfect. Good, Good morning, evening, afternoon, wherever you might be. Exactly. Yay, Rob. Good to see you. Hello. Um, cool. Anybody with thoughts, uh, further thoughts on last week, uh, two weeks ago, our call when we started this topic? Um, yeah, I can say it's, uh, this is related. I just, this week we completed Oliver Stone's, uh, Untold History of the United States, which I only watch one episode every few days because it's really tough going. And, um, there's a, there's a, a huge, um, as as Eisenhower warned, it's the military industrial congressional university corporate complex that is hell bent on exploiting everything. And I and I really have no idea how to um disarm that mentality. And I literally mean disarm because the United States has gone way beyond anything the Romans or the, the British Empire did in terms of um mucking around in other countries and uh we're the most heavily armed uh presence on the planet and there's in 2012 i think we sold 80 percent of the world's armaments and that's an awful lot of money and an awful lot of power to uh, uh try and say hey you know we need to be more ecologically sensible here because people are making huge amounts of money and gathering a lot of power in building our in creating armaments and and bombing the hell out of things so um it's just it, it layered on a, a added another layer of, of complexity of it's not just about ecology and, and waking up, but it's about how do we disarm ourselves to recognize that the enemy is us, as Bogo said. It ain't somebody else. It's it's us collectively. We we need to um, figure out a way where we can uh, not think that we need to be strong by bombing people, but we need to be strong by helping people. I love what you're coming at, but wouldn't the Roman Empire and the Mongol Empire and Alexander the Great's Empire and all those others be larger than the, what the U.S. has sort of tried to do, other than the U.S.'s multiple underhanded attempts to undermine governments around the world? But but are you saying that we have undermined more governments around the world than anybody ever did? Uh, I'm, well, maybe not than anybody ever did, but when in watching this show, you know, he uses the old old school maps of just showing boom boom these countries lighting up and all the places we have gone into and destroyed governments and and installed dictators and 
left behind, you know, like, okay, there were 4,000 uh, U.S. troops killed in Iraq, um, but there were 250 to a million civilians killed. I mean, that just is like, to me, is is bordering on something I don't have a word for in terms of a pathology. Um, so that's just uh, something that's been on my mind since since finishing this series the other day. Thanks. There's a book I just put the title in the chat, Overthrow America's Century of Regime Change from Hawaii to Iraq. And it talks about all the times the U.S. has gone in and overthrown other countries' governments because we didn't like them, starting with Queen Kamehameha in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. uh, Doug, then Gill. Sorry, uh, Doug C., then Gill. Yeah. Um, it strikes me, I've been reading a lot of political theory and in particular, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire and some of Toynbee. And what strikes me is that uh, the issue in the world usually is who has sovereignty. That is, who has the power to change things. In the world we have today, there is no sovereignty. There's nobody who has the authority to really change things. Uh, the closest probably is Russia and China have some structures where the top has a lot of power but it's hardly universal. So the, it seems to me that uh, climate change, which is the title, the topic, uh, requires uh, a global reaction, and we have no authority that can create a global reaction. So let me, <laughs> sorry, Doug, let me slow down what you said, because you said nobody has sovereignty, but then you went to explain it in a way that I think meant Nobody has the power to make global changes that might change the global situation because plenty of people appear to have sovereignty locally. Vladimir Putin has sent his country into a war uh, claiming that Ukraine was attacking them, blah, 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 or that Ukraine was never a country, a whole bunch of things. Like he got, he's got plenty of sovereignty. He doesn't have global support. And he's not. Yeah, that's, support. that's why I said the Russia and China uh, come the closest to having actual so sovereignty. So by sovereignty, you mean a vast, overwhelming majority uh, capacity to do stuff? Uh, the power to actually do things. In Rome, the Senate had the authority, uh, no question. They elected who the emp emperor was. They elected the heads of the military. Uh, they had real sovereignty. Uh, there was no constitution, uh, so they could change any laws they wanted. We're bound in by a constitution which makes it almost barely. impossible to change things. Um, interestingly, our constitution doesn't bind us all that tightly, it appears. Um, and the, the, I've read some interesting things recently about how mutable is the constitution? Shouldn't it be evolving more than it has <clears throat> as times change and so forth? And that's a, a separate conversation from this one. Uh, thank you, Doug. Thanks for explaining. Uh, Gil. Well, the Constitution uh, very intentionally had shock absorbers built into it to 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 damp the rate of change. And you can argue whether there's too much damping, um, but you don't want to have something that can oscillate wildly. You want to have some degree of that. And that's you know, um, we can argue about that for a long time. Uh, the Roman Senate had authority until people killed other people, which is one of the ways that power is exercised. Um, um, where's I going here um to to Ken's point um um you know 80 percent of the armaments in the world come from us a good per some percentage of the other come from our allies um and then of course China and Russia have their own businesses um but I've long felt that the two primary exports of the United States uh are weapons and culture we used to say Hollywood but now it's more than that and of course, technology is another piece of that, which interpenetrates with the culture story. But that's what we do uh, as a as a national business. Um, to Doug's point, which is a really, really important one, uh, you know, how does where where does change driven from? Uh, there is no single global authority like a king or an emperor. Um, there is the United Nations, which for all of its weaknesses has done things, you know, that has done things that have worked like the Montreal Protocol. Uh, and others. Uh, the climate protocols are a much more mixed bag um, because, where was it? Give me a second to find the quote. Um, Latour um, said recently, nope, nope, here it is. 
um, in, in Down to Earth, Latour said, if we still had any doubts on this point, the pseudo controversy over the climate suffices to dispel them. There is no evidence that any major corporation has spent a penny to produce ignorance about the detection of the Higgs boson. But denying the climatic mutation is another matter entirely. Financing floods in ignorance on the part of the public is such a precious commodity that it justifies immense investments. So, you know, the, the, the struggle for global authority is in conflict with the struggle for global financial hegemony and the financialization of everything. Uh, and that's part of the deal. Um, given that, we try to come together in various forms to come to agreement on various things uh, with contending forces that are becoming more and more and more polar. Um, polarized, I guess, is the word for that. Um, so, um, yeah, we, you know, we, 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 we don't have an emperor. Um, we have a, an, a flawed consensus-based system, and what we try to do is build enough agreement among the various players to find, to, to amass enough power to compel some action. Um, and, um, you know, for me, one of the key indicators is the ratio of lobbyists to Congress people in the United States, which was something like, you know, two to, two or three to one in the early 1970s. And it's something like, I forget, 70 or 200 to one now. What, which is one of the ways in which the Constitution could flex is like changing the representational scheme to better adapt to a growing population, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the constitutional compromise of the you know two two senators per state meant one thing when there were 13 states of relatively similar size. And now you have California, Montana. It makes absolutely no sense. But this is the challenge. I mean, you have to have people vote against their self-interest to change that. Um just like we have to have Congress vote against its self-interest to reinstall citizens, you know, to, over, to overturn the citizens of the United case and limit um, the flow of legalized bribery. The people who are being bribed have to vote against being bribed. I think it was Lawrence Lessig who <clears throat> offered to run for president in 2016 or the election before, promising that he would be a single issue candidate. What he would do is revoke Citizens United and then resign as president and someone else would be appointed or his vice president would pick up or something like that. That, that, that ended did, up no, going he, no place. How did he do? Yeah, uh, It went nowhere, yeah. but that was an interesting idea. Yeah. But I mean, they, that's, you know, that, that's the political landscape. And so, you know, my question to Doug, and I've asked you this before, is, is absent... Uh, the alien spaceship landing and imposing uh, a new sense of order on us, Klaatu, Barato, Nikto, and all that stuff. <laughs> uh, you know, kind of two questions. One is, what does it look like? And two is, how do we get there? You have to stand you know, the very notion still when you say that, Gil. Say what? You have to stand very still when, still when you say that. When I say the Klaatu? Yeah, I, I, don't yeah. Have the, I don't have the uniform on either. But you know, uh, you know the 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 hope for a this is this is some of why Trump is so effective is people want a strong leader and I understand your desire for that but uh, we could just as easily get a Trump or a Putin as a Gore or a Thunberg as the you know commander you know ultimate commander so. That's it. I'll stop. And I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna be heading out. I'll I'm, I'm gonna switch to walking mode in a little while. If you see my face disappear. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. Um, other other takes. Uh, anyone sort of new to the conversation want to just uh, jump in uh, around your thoughts on collapse and re renewal? Um, uh, well, I could jump in. Please and, do. Uh, um, and this is particular. This isn't the big collapse and renewal. This is uh, in response to you know, sort of the last five comments. Um, there's, we we have uh, actually, uh, Elon Musk <laughs> made an interesting analogy in a very old interview that uh, Kara Swisher re re broadcast in which he described government as a very large boat with a very small rudder. And uh, mm -hmm. this is a good analogy. <laughs> and, 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 you know, the, you could, you could go on to describe his as a, you know, a speedboat with a turbo jet on it or something. But the the, the idea is this. Um, 
we have a uh, stratified urgency, meaning we've got these things like climate change, you know, that are like really knocking on the door hard. And a lot of these issues that, that get raised, uh, I had some firsthand, as a number of us, I'm sure, have had firsthand contact with the military industrial complex, including the people inside it who were trying to move as as well and as carefully as they could away from weapons and turn that energy into something that actually would help defend the country, but do it by responding to climate change or do it by responding to education or some other kind of thing. Uh, you know, there's a there's a debate that will go on longer than we have time for uh, about the, the relative effectiveness or ineffectiveness of that strategy. And, you know, I, I'm kind of at this uh, point, there's, I'm sure there's other people besides uh, David Snowden who've talked about this strategy where you realize you're kind of in chaos. You know, there's some arguments about that. And that therefore your, your large scale programmatic policy, um, you're not going to be able to implement it. And it might be unwise uh, given, given the chaotic conditions. And what you need to do is do kind of measured experimental interventions that will produce um, pr pr produce a, a hope for a change, but also produce data on the relative effectiveness of what it is you're trying. And that's how I kind of look at these uh, these collapse scenarios. They, they are frighteningly realistic. Um, it doesn't really matter whether uh, the guy we're reading, uh, Neil, uh, you know, whether his 20 year generation thing is is accurate or not, you know, it's easy to shoot down. It's easy to find holes in these theories. My question about any collapse theory is. What what does it give us to look for now that could be helpful? For instance, in the case of that that uh, cycle generation theory, I would say instead of what he has quoted as saying is like, it'll all turn out all right. Uh, I would say, no, 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 no. What's, the, what's that characteristic that you identified for the generation that comes back, comes next and fixes thing? And let's find those people who have those characteristics, whatever generation they're in, and let's get them going uh, together, you know, on some project, you know? So that's, that's a lot of loose ends there that I was trying to tie together, but uh, I'll stop at this point. Mm, yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, Stuart? Uh, yeah, call me arrogant because I hey, arrogant. <laughs> arrived late and didn't hear the comments, but I just wanted to comment on the phenomenal phenomena. Um, um, the, cycl the cyclical nature of things. <clears throat> I realized that um, when I was writing about conflict, that we move from conflict to collaboration. It seems to be a human phenomenon. And, you know, the stock market goes up and then it goes down. Um, a, a meteor um, hit planet Earth. All the dinosaurs were destroyed. But guess what? Um, living systems came back. Um, I, I don't think that's real consoling if you're in the down cycle where shit is hitting the fan before things start to, to turn around. Um, so it, in some ways, it's not any consolation. But it might be a consolation as a mental construct to know that things are bad today. But you know, if we keep tilting at windmills, um, they just might turn around uh, in some form later on. And and I've noticed that a lot of the writing about you know the the disaster of climate change, and and some of the planning for the other poly crisis we we face, it, it all seems to. Um, to say, are we planning to head things off or are we planning to rebuild um, after? Which to me, you know, is just an indication is that there is an after um, and, uh, and, and we can think about, you know, what, we, what that might look like and how to um, facilitate it. At least that's my, that's my two cents. And it's great to see Kevin and Doug's hands up because I'm, I'm sure they'll have something uh, wise to say. Um, thank you. Um, Kevin, go ahead. Yeah, you know, I'm getting further involved with the uh, 
different groups uh, who are trying to get legal status for rivers or a town to have status around a river. And I just put a, a link into a town in uh, Pennsylvania that after 10 years uh, has won and gotten uh, that there was a, a company that was uh, based there that wanted to put its toxic fracking mess into something uh, below the groundwater so there would be no leakage. And they fought and now they, the company has said, okay, we, we will we'll put a bubble around it. We, we, will, we will protect that. And the number of court cases has, has tripled in the last five years uh, around that. <clears throat> the folks we're working with, Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, wrote the law for the country of Ecuador that two weeks ago used that law to stop mining in the rainforest. Uh, you know, the, the thing about legal status is really interesting because corporations are a legal fiction and people are have personhood, and, and, but the river doesn't. So, you know, if I hit Jerry, he can sue me. If I do damage to a company, he can sue me. Our regulations say this is how much you can damage the river. And with rights, the river can say, no, you can't damage, let's just say me, as, a, as much a person as a corporation. And so you can, you know, you can actually stop that. And it's, a, it's, creating a, it's happening all over the country. Uh, and again, it's, it's this incremental stuff that Roberta Kaplan, Kaplan did with the LGBT laws and uh, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg did with women's rights and, you know, finding pl places that, you know, women could get a checking account and then women could get uh, a land deed and women could sign a loan note. And none of those things became a big cause celeb as uh, Roe v. Wade did. And so, you know, it, it, it's happening all over. And I think it, it uh, it's there, there are now some precedents of action that are, are pretty interesting. Um, Kevin, just to stay for a second on personhood for rivers, personhood for nature is, I think, the broader umbrella. <clears throat> and I'm curious about rivers as the client here, because uh, is, was nature just too broad and, and, and vague? Uh, what, well, how, so, and, and, is, and is rivers like some kind of special lever because they have well, special properties yeah. in this dilemma? Yeah, it's it's the emotional resonance. You know, sometimes it can be a wetland that everybody cares about. You know, it's 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 where could you house some emotion next to a piece of nature? In uh, in Ecuador, it was a, a broad rights of nature, but so you, you use whatever will work. We've already got a group caring about and and identifying with the Swannanoa River, so that's what we're we're doing there. And you have to have a town or city who then gets a bill of rights essentially to because right now a town cannot stop a corporation that the sea that the state allows to pollute or do anything there and so they're saying you you know you cannot transport toxic waste and so it's it's just you know incremental grinding a polycentric incremental grinding to change things as as it was with civil rights women's rights and and lgbtq rights thank you um, yeah, some places it's a lake, you know, it depends on what, what, what do people resonate with, you know. Before I go to Doug, anyone else with strong feelings or thoughts or intuitions about personhood for nature and how this, how it plays in the conversation? Doug, see, the floor is yours. Well, just to respond to that, it's interesting. Uh, the sovereignty of rivers uh, when they tend to flood, do we just let them do that? Is that part of giving uh, the vote to the river? Uh, I want to come in. There's if so if many... a person did that, you, you would have recourse. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it, it, that's not a real serious question, I'm sure. There's so many uh, good progressive projects around regeneration in one form or another going on in the world today, all over the place. The problem is almost all those projects increase economic activity, not replace it. Uh, so uh, they contribute to uh, climate change by contributing to CO2. And it seems to me that's a place where we're stuck. We just do not have a handle on how to lower economic activity, which is what we need. So Doug? Back to the point about sovereignty. Uh, the Roman Senate had sovereignty. It was not in a single person, uh, although often there was an emperor, but they had to deal through the Senate. 
we don't have any organization which has sovereignty in the world now, uh, except possibly Russia and China. Um, Doug, I want to come back to your premise about lowering economic activity. And you've been you've mentioned it many times over time here in the call. And I'm wondering, what have you discovered? What models are there about how this works? Because there's a there's plenty of models. Well, there are models, certainly, of how economies work and how uh, different kinds of resources or money flow through uh, economies. Uh, there are growth models. There are other kinds of things. Uh, have you seen anyone model out the cessation of economic activity as a, a way to go about, you know, a, a, as a viable future of any sort? Like you're, you're kind. I think so. It sounds to a naive listener. It sounds like you're saying we should all go grow grow veggies in our backyard and stop buying anything, stop traveling, stop doing everything, just cease and make food or something like that, because then there'd be very little economic activity. Um, and I don't think that's an appealing future or even a potentially viable future for most naive listeners. So I'm trying to figure out how do I get from, from your thesis to something that feels tangible, useful, and even doable? And, and whoever else my, feels differently from me. basic point is we okay. can't do that. Uh, there is no plan to do it. What do you mean? What we're up against then is we're going to have breaking systems and that's going to force change but it's not going to be voluntary uh, or democratic. So when you ask us, when you say all the solutions are not viable because they cause more economic activity, you're, you're effectively selling against any and all attempts to resolve the problem that other people are coming up with. because I, all... I think where we are is we're not going to come up with any uh, solution along the line that you're thinking about. So we're going to be dealing with collapse, which is going to force change. And the collapse is going to be not universal. It's going to be episodic here and there. Like we're seeing that parts of the world are ceasing to be economically viable in their ag agriculture because of temperature. Uh, that's the model we're going to be coping with. So I think it's not going to be voluntary. So I think what I'm asking is, should your focus then be something like Jem Bendel's focus on deep adaptation? Since you, you, it sounds like you're assuming we ain't going to take any drastic measures like this. So we're heading right toward the cliff, the wall, the waterfall, whatever you want to call it. Um, and, and in that case, I think what you want is as good an adaptation to these horrible circumstances that are likely coming as possible. Am I wrong? Yes. Where am I wrong? You're not wrong. <laughs> you're, you're right. Oh, Deep okay. adaptation. And we don't know what that looks like. So instead of telling us to cease all economic activity, why don't you just jump on Jim Bendel's bandwagon and help us all learn how to adapt better? I think I'm, I'm asking, I'm asking, I'm asking you to slow down your, 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 the thing you bring into this conversation often, which is we need to stop all economic activity, all remedies to try to first you, first you say uh, often um, we should be paying attention only to climate change. It is the, the 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 problem of our era. If we don't deal with it, all really bad things happen. Then you say, and the way to do that is to not cause any more economic activity because that's the problem. And then I'm left hanging. And I'm trying to figure out how to not be hanging at the end of your argument. Well, notice I haven't said all economic activity. I'm saying that projects to correct climate change are economically inducing projects, almost all of them. Uh, so that's a, just to be conscious of that, that what we're doing in terms of trying to correct the system is creating new economic activity, uh, replacing old in many cases, but in ways that uh, are very stimulating to uh, CO2. And so I think we're stuck. I mean, that's, uh, and the, I don't know what deep adaptation really looks like. I don't think anybody really does because it's so, uh, it's going to be kind of random. Well, Jim has a pretty big following. I've not read a lot of his work, but I've met him. I know him. He's an interesting young guy who got really, really angry about all this stuff, the way you're angry about this stuff. Um, so following your logic from a moment ago, it seems like a useful thing you could propose or find and promote is a metric for 
economic activity that helps remediate climate change and its and its carbon effects. Basically, no, let, let me let me back up. I, okay. I think we made the mistake of replacing politics with economics. Economics is the way we make decisions in this society, and by its very nature, it's not systemic across the whole society. It's only the people who have money, and that's part of where we're stuck. I'm unclear that I agree with the statement that economics is how we make decisions in the society. Uh, anyone else want to, uh, before I go to Stuart and Kevin, unless yeah. you point to yes. Kevin. Okay, <laughs> good. Let me, let me go, Stu let me go Stuart, then Kevin. Okay, yeah. Great. And, and this is, um, uh, in response to everything that's been being said, nothing, nothing new. Um, and Jerry, I'll, I'll push back on the notion that, you know, it's politics and not economics. It's all economics. Um, you know, just look at, at Citizens United and how we, we live with a Congress that, you know, um, because the Supreme Court has legalized bribery. It's all economics that's driving uh, the politics. Um, it's, 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 it's behind it. Um, and it, it's just present. And I think that that's not just true for the U.S. system. I think that there's a level of truth that, that's that's um, always present, maybe not in the social democracies of, of, of Europe as much, but it certainly is here, you know, um, in the U.S. So there's, these notions of, of cyclical legal change and economic um, activity um, I think that they're all very, very um, related. We had great social change as a result of legal activity in the 1960s and 70s. Um, but the mindsets of people weren't changed. You know, there was a legislative solution um, because, you know, unfortunately, so many lawyers are, are involved in, in decision making and in the politics of, of the US. But they didn't change the mindsets of people. And guess what? We're seeing all of this rear its ugly head um, today again. So it was never really solved by legislation. Um, legal change is slow. OK, um, I think it's great that that there's a, you know, a foothold, a crack in the ice that that and I, I, I read with joy when Kevin reported that in his uh, post the other day. Um, and it's a, certainly a step in the in in the right direction. In terms of hanging in through the cyclical changes, I think what's really important is to recognize that all the tilting at windmills that we're doing is not going to have a uh, likely impact in our lifetimes. Um, but maybe it will in in the longer um, road. Just like I talked about um, legal, changes, not creating mindset changes, the same thing is true of economic um, activity. You know, historically, we've had these kinship societies, maybe they were not as great as we think they were, but at least um, people persisted for millennials. You know, is our all our technical advancement and economic activity and wealth and the comfort we live in a good thing? Um, yeah, <laughs> for those of us who have reaped the benefits of it, but is it good for long-term, quote, health of this biosphere and supporting future generations? Certainly, you know, Native Americans would say um, absolutely not. Um, so um, here we are in an interesting moment of fulcrum in time, um, um, changing mindsets around economic activity would be the critical piece to understand how we got to this particular place. Um, Ken, you did a beautiful analysis of it. I haven't seen the final product yet in terms of how we how we got to the place of burning fossil fuels, but I'm sure that something similar could be done about the economic systems we developed that sustain us, that are the basic frame of everybody's mindset when they look at all kinds of social phenomenon, you know, um, even the people who are uh, advocating great change analyze it in terms of profit and loss and try to squeeze it into an economic model. And I don't know if that's really a viable solution for the long term. Um, so that's my two cents.
Mm -hmm. Thanks, Stuart. And you started with the contrast of economics versus politics, which for me is a bit of a red herring because picking one or the other, picking one or the other changes your priorities a lot. If you say the problem is economic and you head toward the thing you said at the end, then what we need is economic incentives and politics be damned. And if we think the problem is politics, then what we need is to screw, uh, you know, fix fix free speech, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know. I think that's al almost a dog chasing its tail because those are a series of problems. Uh, Kevin, you stepped out of the queue. I'd love to go yeah, back no, to you I'm, if you I'm want to stay in the queue. I just thought since I was in the queue, I lowered my hand. There, there is a movement to reduce economic activity. It's degrowth. Right. <clears throat> and uh, I, I got real excited somewhere around the, the turn of the year or so about degrowth and read the books, spent an hour and a half uh, for six weeks every morning researching it, and I discovered it had a, a hard edge. If you were in degrowth, you believed in it. And there was no periphery. There was no next concentric circle of people entering. And uh, that, that the idea of degrowth is so anti-American in American culture that it was not ever going to work. And so I just stopped because it, it makes sense, just like true cost accounting has always made sense since Herman Daly cooked it up at the Yale Forestry School where you include externalities, but people don't do it. So I stopped researching it it's a really good thing and and it and it it is not the frame that will work that's all damn it um uh klaus then doug b yeah so so i totally agree with Stuart. the the the, the challenge is to is is to change mindsets you still see uh, on linkedin and social media people passionately uh arguing against climate science um, and, and rejecting the idea that there is uh, an inherent problem you know, caused by our economic activity. And you can see, I mean, for example, uh, the food industry fighting with Mexico, which wants to outlaw the use of glyphosate and GMO corn. Uh, they want because uh, of the destructive nature it has, not just on the soil, but also in human health. And we are willing to engage our political machine to intimidate Mexico, you know, to take that off the chart and convert where if, if there was a willing mindset, this would be a wonderful opportunity to change the types of crops we are growing here and move into organic sustainable practices. But rather than that, we fight in the political spectrum. But I also don't, quite agree with Doug, you know, that um, that every economic activity will lead to, to or every mitigation activity will lead to, to more uh, 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 polluting activity. Because, and so the, the great example, I think, here is direct air capture. You know, the US government, the Biden administration just allocated something like $1.7 billion for a direct air capture technology, which is complete nonsense. I mean, it just has zero uh, a chance of making an impact that's even measurable. Um, whereas soil recarbonization um, would, it, uh, is, is readily available and we know it works and it has multiple beneficial uh, impacts you know, on, on the entire biosphere. Um, so why don't we talk about soil? Why don't we give 1.7 billion dollars you know, to to advance the 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 soil recarbonization project instead? So so it and this is completely mindset driven, right? There is still a rejection to accept the science and to accept you not know, the reality of uh, uh, of where we are heading, and and so how to how to how to change that, you know, these still competing forces in the political system where people just absolutely insist that it ain't so. Now, when you, uh, you, you can get on discussions with people who seem to have you know, a professional background and well-educated and all of this, and they stubbornly absolutely reject and refuse the idea that uh, climate is something to, to really be concerned about. So I don't know how to change that, and how to, but because it is driven by you know, the the corporate uh, mindset that drives ninety percent of our media. You know? 
Um, Doug B, and let's change the pace of the conversation a little bit. So please uh, take a pause or take your time coming into the conversation. So I was uh, I was sitting at my desk and imagining if I had a shot sitting across a table from the CEO of one of the three largest global oil companies, and I had a moment to pitch. Um, and what occurred to me um, is if it was possible to step out of the polarized frame and the judgment frame and to reorient around economics, and repurpose of economics by its own rules in its own frame and uh, sort of reorient and redirect it, um, not in how it does economics, but in what activity, what actions it actually is doing that is the source of its profit. So if oil companies, I mean, would there be immediate short term, like huge capital need and demand? Yeah. Um, but if oil companies were to shift their business model and instead of being rooted in oil, its extraction, its sale, and its consumption, to being uh, in the business of remediating the effects of fossil fuels on a global level and distribution of renewables, sort of retool, repurpose. Like, there's a lot of money to be made in that because there's a lot of work to do. Recycling plastics, truly recycling plastics, not the version of collecting and then them going to landfills, separating and going to land. So like recycling plastics, a lot of money in that. Um, and pipelines redistributing hydrogen instead of fossil fuels and um, distilleries repurposed into whatever they could or should be repurposed into to produce whatever they should be producing in service to regenerative, survivable, thrivable. I'll stop there on oil companies. So what about the military? Like armies in the military are designed for what? Well, I mean, right now for killing and for projection, assertion of power and control of authority, but they happen to be really organized, really structured, really effective and really productive at doing things. The Army Corps of Engineers has done some of the most extraordinary constructions on the planet in staggeringly short periods of time in service to solving huge challenges. And um, instead of killing, um, providing support, providing security, undergirding and, and, and um, and executing aid and delivery of meeting needs and all of that. So um, I think it's a lack of imagination <laughs> that if we could like 
get out of the polarized frame and get out of the this instead of that, the or construct, which is irreconcilable, irrefutable, and to Doug's point, um, unresolvable. So in the face of where the path we're on is collapse. But if economics could be sort of turned around 180 degrees, have it still be profitable, but where it's generating its profit and how it's oriented the industrial military complex um, in service to reconstructing and, and restoring and serving massive populations in need um, as a generative force and capacity with tremendous resource uh, that could be repurposed. So I, I just throw that out as a, like for shits and giggles and and with that, I'm complete. I think your proposal is more serious than shits and giggles, and I appreciate it. And uh, I think many of us are trying to think, how do we flip some of these equations or dynamics or forces? And that would be a terrific thing. A little jujitsu on market forces or political forces or whatever would be awesome. Just, just very quickly. Um... It's, in some ways, it's about the legal structure and what corporations are mandated to do generally. Two, I was I was um, doing some research. This is twenty years ago. About um, it was before the 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 pandemic, and when they were talking about bird flus, and I was doing some research about responses to um, activity like that, and 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 found out that um, IBM, for example. It's got a huge, huge disaster recovery arm of the organization that does extraordinary things all over the world in terms of, you know, providing technology when technology um, falls apart, all as part of their, you know, giving. Um, there's a mindset shift. Love that. Can they rescue servers when they're flooded with pool water? <laughs> they can do anything, Jerry. <laughs> Superhuman. I love that. Um Ken, then Carl, and please take your time stepping in. And when you speak, just if you'll keep your hand up while you speak, because when you remove your hand, if other people have their hand up, your square goes disappears into the crowd, and it's easier to see you when you're sort of up high. So just as a, as a protocol, unmute, but uh, leave that hand up for a bit until you're done talking, please. I shall leave my hand up. However, I've noticed that in this later version of Zoom, it tends to, after a few seconds, say, we're going to lower your hand for you. So um, Zoom if is, I jump around the screen, it's not own. my fault. Yeah, So thanks. Um, thanks, Doug. Very much thinking along the lines I've been thinking of. Um, I think we need to rethink our fundamental assumptions around economics. And, um, you know, we have a, an economic ordering to our uh, society which is based on the earth as inert um, as something to be exploited yeah. and used. And, you know, um, and I think that's, that's a completely wrong way that the whole paradigm is destructive. So um, rather than, and I don't think it's possible to fix from inside where we are. I think it's going to be that we need to um, need a whole new cloth. And um, as I just wrote in the Plex, the, there will be, some elements of what we're currently um, uh, dealing with, but the the real challenging thinking is going to come from the margins and from places we don't expect it, which means those who are defending the status quo will resist tremendously. But as long as we think that it's okay to destroy life support systems in terms of it's profitable, um, that's a self-terminating system. And it might terminate a lot more than just one self. It might terminate billions of cells. So uh, I don't know how to get there. I don't know what it looks like. I think there's a lot of um, wisdom to be gained in looking at many First Nations um, people. Yes, Gil, I'm talking we as in human beings here, us humans. Um, I, I think there's a tremendous amount of, of wisdom to be gained from studying uh, people like Tyson Yankaporta, Robin Wall Kimmerer, um, the guy uh, who wrote uh, the kinship worldview. I don't think that's sufficient, but it's it's a starting place. When we 
see ourselves as a part of nature rather than apart from nature, then our our way of of um, approaching the world, of being in the world shifts dramatically. And I don't know how to make that. I don't know what the leverage point is um, for that, but I'm really quite encouraged to see how widely this idea is spreading. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of people talking about it. It might not be in the mainstream, but in the in the alternate stream, uh, there's tremendous amount of, of chatter on the web about this. So um, thank you, Don Charn Jacobs. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I'm encouraged there. Um, and I think it's going to be a rough ride. I think there's probably going to be an awful lot of radical discontinuities that, that could derail the entire system. A couple of things that I personally think about are, one, the Puritan streak in this country, which says you can't give anybody who doesn't deserve something that they don't deserve, has to be gotten rid of. That's got to be, you know, it's, it's very problematic. Um, two, I think quality shifts to if we build things to last for thousands, tens of thousands of years, you know, what's the infrastructure humanity needs to survive um, for the long term and devote ourselves to caring for the whole rather than individuals. Those are a couple of things that are, that are going to be, you know, the gospel is prosperity. Jesus wants you to be rich. Um, <laughs> Amen, brother. Jesus wants you to be rich. Um, so, so I think there's actually a lot of, uh, a lot of, I don't want to use the word resources, a lot of sources of wisdom and information and knowledge and understanding. I think understanding is different than knowledge because um, when you understand something, it doesn't matter how much you know about it. You know, you, it's a, as, as Max Neef says, it's, it's exists on, understanding and knowledge exist, exist on separate shores and require separate piloting and an understanding that we are of the earth. Um, that we come from the earth and that if we, as Chief Seattle says, whatever befalls the sons and daughters of, uh, whatever befalls the earth, befalls the sons and daughters of the earth. So if we start treating Gaia as a living organism, as a source of all life and attending to biomimicry, um, you know, I'm like, here's how evolution handles the problem of energy and mobility and whatnot. Then there's, there's tremendous things we can learn. But it's going to be very, very challenging in terms of making that shift, given how many people are invested in the old system. And yet we know from history that when you reach a tipping point, things look just fine on Monday. And then at midnight, the clock strikes and suddenly you're in a whole new world and things look very different. And we might be two minutes to midnight. Who knows? Anyway, thanks. Carl, off to you, but uh, please take your time. Yeah, every time somebody says something, there's about three, <laughs> three, three things that pop up. Uh, actually, I just was going through, I'm going to work on um, revising a playlist that I have. So I'll share a YouTube playlist, but um, um, I brought up Ray Anderson a bunch of times. This is a video from 12 years ago, 1.04 K views in 12 years. I'm probably point, I might be the 0.04. I don't know how many times I get <laughs> counted and stuff, but Ray Anderson, uh, the my two primary visionaries, Doug Engelbart and William E. Smith, they, they um, inspired a, a me coming up with the term uh, paradigm leaps. And this Ray Anderson is, is, is like the prime example, really. Um, he's, um, there was a, I mean, it's a classic story too. It's like, I was cleaning out a storeroom in, um, at General Services Administration with all old equipment. I opened, this was probably about 2007. And I open up this box and there's a bunch of VHS tapes of, of um, Joe Moravec, the, the um, commissioner of the public building service interviewing Ray Anderson, um, 2002. And uh, I was able to discover it on, on um, archive.org and downloaded it and then uploaded it to my uh, YouTube. But 
heat. I've got the visionary saying, you know, there's something beyond sustainability. He talks about you know, like sustainability is do no more harm and we need to get to restorative. We need to get to helping the planet heal. In fact, that's not even far enough. So I've got, I've come up with catalytic leaps is the name I want for, my, uh, for the company. And it's like, we need to be catalytic. We need to help the planet heal faster and stuff. So it's kind of like the rudder and um, Bucky Fuller with, uh, with the trim tab kind of thing, but it's like leveraging the lever. I mean, so taking it to a, another level. So um, there's this amazing video. It's only four minutes long and he boils. It was a Swedish doctor looking at childhood cancer and they, it really boils down to like four principles um, of sustainability um, the natural step framework and that's really uh, underlying a lot of um, of Ray Anderson's work but I mean he's I mean if you go to any if you go to any hotel or any office building you'll notice it's square carpet tiles and it's interface carpet and it's they actually developed a um, carpet as a service model, really. It's like the carpet wears out, they come pick it up, they feed it back into the process, they lay down new carpet for you, and they've used no new oil for almost for over 10 years now. Carpet making um, business. I mean, can, is there a more petrochemical intensive thing than making nylon? and stuff. Um, so this is one piece of it. Another thing I ran across is the DOI, the, like with being a, um, working on my academic uh, research and stuff, everything is now DOI. You have to have that in your references. And I was looking at their site and there was actually a new human digital group. So um, this might actually be the this might actually be part of the solution to deal with what's going on in Hollywood because there's basically a D a DOI is could be um, that people have an a DOI and that's the that could be the um, basis for reimbursement or for uh, um, type of thing. Fascinating. It's like could a river have a DOI? <laughs> Is the a DOI a, a personhood? Can you explain a DOI, Carl? I'm... Um, it's the um, yeah. I'll post a link to the site. I found it uh, looking actually at the DOI um, organization, but um, what, what does it stand for? It's like the ISBN number on steroids. Let me you, see. Oh, so you mean like DOI? Yeah. Okay, I was hearing DLI. Oh, DLI. So DOI is a digital object identifier, I think. Yeah. Yeah, digital object identifier. Yeah. yeah. To that as well. My apologies. I was mishearing yeah. you in two different ways. So, um, well, another thing I've um, posted, I've, I've shared it with Doug years ago, um, Doug B., um, and stuff, but there's the Koji people down in Colombia, and they there's a movie, the Aluna, and stuff. But their their message to the world is you must protect the rivers. So I mean, if we if if the earth is a living is a living system, the rivers are like our capillaries for our blood our our bloodstream. The rainforests are our lungs. <laughs> I mean. Um, so yeah, so there's um, a couple of things there. Um, I just ran across it literally. I mean, it's hard to believe it's been around for a long time, but there's actually a whole evidence-based policy-making effort in uh, at the federal level um, and stuff. So I'll, I'll be writing up more about that to share next week. Um, and stuff but i mean it's evident right what a concept that you're actually basing policy on, on evidence and stuff so um those are some of the things that are um, been giving me some some hope i'm also going to post a link to uh um 
we've had a group in DC um, back 15, 20 years ago now um, called uh, Golden Fleece. And it was the organizational storytelling community. And uh, based, one of the things we had done was uh, organize the Smithsonian Storytelling Weekend. So I'm looking to try to see if we can rekindle that to have an event next summer. But I'll post a link to uh, Mary Alice Arthur. She has a TED Talk that's just really amazing um, and stuff. She's just one of them. We got... Steve Denning, who's done a lot of work for, he's written a number of books and um, a lot of um, articles in Forbes. He he takes IBM to task for their for their um, maximizing stakeholder value. It's not about that IBM. It's about market share. <laughs> they, you can have a total crap project product, and if you're first to market. It, it's latched on. You have these, you know, one monopoly leverage to get an, another monopoly. I mean, it's been that's been going on for almost thirty years now. So that that's a main part of the problem. And then I'll close with um, I mentioned it before, but um, Tuesday the twelfth is going to be the release of Marjorie Kelly's book on wealth supremacy. So that's another one that. Um, people need to add to the list and she's a lovely dynamic speaker etc and you know still kicking i think she lives in berkeley or oakland um yeah she was she was um she's not been associated with that democracy collaborative um group too um so that that's an amazing group that needs the needs more exploration and conversation within this community to, yeah. I, I get overwhelmed though. I mean, I have 15,000 unread messages from like OGM. It's just uh, the band, I just do not have the bandwidth to deal they, with. They it's told still us. 1700, it's 1700 conversations. I turn on conversation threads and it's like over 1700 conversations. They so, told us to produce in quantity. Paid, though <laughs> I'll, I'll try to do a better, um, job of that so um, with that I'll go ahead and, and pass it on to Stuart thanks Carl yeah um <clears throat> two thoughts one um <laughs> along with Mar uh, Marjorie Kelly's new book uh there's a new Rolling Stone out selling Rolling Stones album that's going to come out on the 20th of October, <laughs> and I watched the um, <clears throat> the video of the first single that was reduced from that. It's kind of kind of cool to see what what they've done with technology in terms of how the old Rolling Stones are are, are presented, um, but more more akin to the topic that we're talking about. Um, I facilitated a half day, half a day of the annual retreat for the Sonoma, Sonoma County employees uh, yesterday. Now, admittedly, um, it's a bubble here in Northern California. There's no question about it. But I was just so engaged and positively um, enthused by the value set that I saw demonstrated and the level of engagement in terms of learning um, in that context. You know, I don't know what that means in terms of uh, the action, um, but it, it kind of goes to the, the idea that, um, I don't remember who it was that was talking about, but that's okay, because these conversations kind of have one voice in some sense. Um, the power of the military to do great things. You know, unfortunately, you'd have all of the, the right wing um, civil libertarians, you know, pushing back on that for their own political reasons without a level of real pragmatism, because um, we need large institutions who can do uh, good things. Um, so, yeah, that's all I wanted to share. Oh, and, and this notion of and thank you, um, Carl, for for 
going back to the notion of, of rivers, there's something so incredibly spiritual about the, the, the power um, and presence of rivers as, as the, the macro to the micro systems that, that keep us uh, alive and enable us to breathe. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, rivers are really interesting. I, I, we used to live in Noe Valley in San Francisco, and the Mission District is just below. And at some point, I remember some artist uh, as a piece of installation, uh, environmental installation art painted on a few of the streets the course of one of the rivers that used to cut through the Mission District in blue, in water color. And, and it was really interesting because you'd see this odd shape and it was kind of let off under a building. And, and, it, and there's plenty of places. There's a park near me in Portland called Tanner Springs Park because there was a spring that originated in the hills over to my left and came through this neighborhood and then passed a couple tanneries that used to you know, litter the area. And uh, it is now a, a cute little eco park of a tiny block in size. Uh, and it just has a hint that there used to be a spring there. And then if you've read Jim McPhee uh, or John McPhee or uh, Cadillac Desert or anything like that about trying to tame rivers and the result of, of those kinds of efforts, uh, it's craziness what we do and what we've tried to do. Yeah. And th yeah. now there's a huge movement to undam rivers because the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers went so haywire. Uh, yeah. They were basically in competition with Wait, Cadillac Desert's plot is that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers were in, in competition with what was the other organization? another government organization, I'll figure it out and put it in the chat. Um, they, they were kind of trying to outdo each other for pork uh, projects that Congress people would like, because there's nothing like a big construction project in your district to employ people and do whatever. And then all this stuff creates the socialist water system in the United States where water, which is pretty expensive to get to people, is given to them for very little money and drains the aquifers and screws up the rivers and all that. So, sorry, there's just this whole rat's nest of issues around water and rivers. And Klaus, I know, has been really focused on water as a simple entry point to the regenerative economy and regenerative agriculture. And I kind of agree a lot on that. And, and water is endlessly fascinating. Sorry, Stuart, go ahead. No, that's OK. No, years ago, I had a great conversation with a guy who was a tribal chief, uh, but also had an MBA and a law degree from Harvard. And he talked about his his. Um, kind of prophetic vision for the future that when we start to run out of fresh water, uh, there's a high percentage of fresh water that's on Native American lands. And he was just gearing up for battle for when the, the government forces were going <laughs> to try to fuck the Indians again. No, no, you know, there, there you go. Um, years ago, uh, not that long ago, in the early 2000s, I lived up on, on Golf Links Road um, near the freeway um, in, in, um, in Oakland. And I had a creek that ran through the back of my yard. And it was amazing when we had a lot of rain because the tree, creek drained five canyons and it would be literally an amazing whitewater rumbling scenario. Uh, but one day I had a, 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 a um, mechanic doing some repair work on a garage door who said, yeah, way back when, when I was a kid, which was 70, 80 years ago, my father used to tell me stories about, he used to go salmon fishing in, 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 in these particular um, creeks. There are photos of fishermen with salmon as tall as they are. There used yeah. to be some mega fish yeah. swimming around. We got yeah. rid of all the mega yeah. fish. The, the last piece is a wonderful scene from the movie Out of Africa, when um, Meryl Streep has planted all these coffee crops and there's a great deal of rain. And her native assistant um, <laughs> says to her, "Ma'am, this this river want to go to Mombasa. Don't don't want to go where you want to, where you want to send it." <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Uh, Ken, please, at your own pace. And thanks for the extra breath. Um, along these lines, I just wrote a book a few months ago called Water Always Wins, Surviving and Thriving in an Age of uh, Drought and Deluge. Uh, Erica Geis, she's locally uh, in San Francisco Bay Area, writer. Um, Slow water is the future. Um, 
we have um, covered the earth with so much concrete and culverted streams and like the the ability of the earth to absorb water and have it percolate is so important. Um, I recently saw a great uh, little short video of a, a watershed somewhere in I think it's in Arizona where these people have put in over 2000 um, rock dams and they're not, you know, they don't dam up in terms of creating big, uh, big reservoirs behind them. Um, they allow water to flow slowly and it percolates. And the, the, the very next watershed over is in tremendous drought. And yet this particular watershed, because of all of these rock dams, um, is supporting an abundance of, of life that requires water. Um, one of the things I got from this book is people who study water, they call dams gray infrastructure. And they talk about dams and levees. They say there's two kinds of levees, those that have broken and those that are going to break. Levees never, ever survive. They always end up breaking. And I love the idea of water always wins because she's like, you know, the planet is a water planet and it's going to do what it does. But we have sucked up so much water. And now it's it's coming down in places in in um, uh, in quantities that are completely overwhelming our infrastructure. Um, look at the flooding in Vermont uh, earlier this year, and what's just happened in somewhere in Europe, uh, Tur Turkey, Greece, 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 and Turkey, right? Is Spain, um, and there's major rivers in the in the in the world now that no longer reach the ocean because they've been so drained. Um, so water is certainly one of the big key, um, elements that has to be considered of how to, if we're going to restore Gaia's, um, ability to generate life, life support, water is going to be absolutely critical to that. How do we ensure that water gets to where it needs to go, um, and gets there slowly. And I know, I wish we had, uh, Paul Crafell on this call, cause he's another great guy when it comes to water. I mean, he's just done so much. Um, so I don't hear a lot of people talking about, um, water as, as, and water is life with no one of water. There's no life. Anyway, a couple of thoughts. Sorry, one, one quick thing. There's actually people now who are, are doing, um, gorilla beavering. Um, where they're they're uh, bringing beavers into watersheds surreptitiously, and the beavers are great at slowing water down. Um, and I, I think I, I read this. I, I I'm not entirely sure it's true, but beavers build dams because they hate the sound of running water. So they they you oh. know they're kind of slowing it down. But I don't know if that's true or not. I just read that somewhere. You could wreak havoc on people's golf courses that way. Yeah, it should be fine with me. Let's start with Bedminster. You know, there, there are some dynamics around water that just um, that just seem to be so obvious um, when you when you look at the mechanics of it. So one thing that industrial agriculture does, you know, by the application of synthetic fertilizers and pesticides and I mean herbicides and so on, is it dries out the soil. Uh, because it harms the soil microbiome, so it, it disrupts the cycle, you know, of of uh, photosynthesis sequestering uh, uh, nitrogen, carbon into into its root systems, and then distributes it there. So roughly twenty five percent of the greenhouse gases of the carbon in the atmosphere has actually been released from the soil because of farming practices. So when when the soil dries out, when when, when the soil microorganisms get get harmed, then the, 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 it releases its carbon, but then it also loses its capacity to hold on to water. So for every one percent, and this is now a number that that uh, is is has gone all over the place. For every one percent of soil organic matter, uh, it can hold an additional twenty thousand gallons of water per acre. So when you when you think that healthy soil holds between four and ten percent of soil organic matter, I mean organic soil, that's a ton of water. I mean these are when you think of California alone. If California California's farmers were to add one percent 
of soil organic matter by changing their practices, they would they would sequester you know something like 1.5 million acre feet of water. You know, forget about building more you know, dams and and all of this. And but there is another phenomenon that's associated with this. It's called the small rain, the small water cycle. So when when soil is is saturated with water, you have a process that's called evapo evapo uh, uh, transpiration, right? So 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 water uh, uh, is being is uh, uh, evaporates and creates a a local rain cycle. So about forty percent of rain is actually coming from this evapotranspiration cycle, the hydrological cycle that sits in place. So when you now think that we have depleted millions of acres of farmland you now across the, I mean, look at California, but Arizona, I mean, even here in Oregon, anywhere you look, you have these millions of acres of, of open soil, you know, farmland that's completely dry. So that disrupts the rain cycle in ways that we just, we just haven't really understood or accepted. Now, so even, even scientists, Fail to acknowledge this this phenomena here. So they 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 the the focusing on water in that sense, you know, of of uh, of healing the soil back to health, so it 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 uh, can absorb and hold hold water, seems to be the most immediate um, solution, if there is such a thing as a solution, but the most immediate mitigation practice to restore uh, uh, a semblance of normalcy to our weather patterns. Um, and and so I, I have I, I mean I have not had any any pushback on that, you know, putting that out uh, with with uh, groups that are focused on uh, climate science. Uh, so it seems to be, it seems to be the most logic uh, engagement, you know, because eighty percent, like in the high desert, eighty-six percent of water is used by farmers, right? So it seems to be the most logical thing to focus on agriculture and shift you know, out of these industrial chemically intensive practices. Thank you, Klaus. Um, we're getting near the end of today's call, and I just wanted to say a couple things um around how we're going about this and what we might do next I, i'm i love this topic i think we're just sort of slowly thinking into it i think we've slowed down only a tiny bit we haven't slowed down that much i'm interested in uh being a little bit more uh, i don't know exactly what words to put around it i hate to say systematic or methodical or or uh, formal those are scary words to a group like this uh, but uh, I think, uh, why don't we in two weeks do this again, uh, same topic and go a little deeper, do more research, uh, pick, pick a couple of books and let's, let's slow down and talk about Marjorie Kelly's new book or, or whichever of these. So that's one thought. Uh, second thought is I'm really interested in the revitalization side of this. So there's, there's a piece of me that's fascinated by models of doom and how do civilizations collapse. And I'm going to do a little bit of homework on that, uh, myself, but I'm really more in, intrigued, compelled, uh, and, and desirous of working on the revitalization piece of it. And Klaus has found his way toward water, and it's it's a thing that really I, I love as well, uh, but also soil fertility. And it, it seems like, and I put in the chat a, a little moment ago, water principles plus soil fertility. And maybe I'm just describing the the basic, uh, uh, the basic, uh, insights behind regenerative agriculture or something like that. But I know that permaculture was a movement a couple of decades ago and it got some people, but it, it felt like it was about farming and growing food, I think, to a lot of people where taming water and collaborating with water, not harnessing water the way the Army Corps of Engineers did, but learning to collaborate with water the way Paul Crafell tries to sort of advocate for, as, as Ken was pointing to in the chat, um, is important, but it, it, there are some generalizable principles from such work. And then improving soil fertility as 
a, a, a side objective. You don't, I don't think you go about directly doing that. It's like, you, you don't, you don't go about uh, directly achieving happiness. You do things that as a side product deliver you some happiness. Uh, and that makes you much happier than actually trying to go out and do the hedonic thing about, I'm going to buy something that's going to make me happy or some, some event. Uh, and I think that improving our environments and our food systems and all that is kind of like that. It's like, if we can help people learn some practices and, and throw in some measures and we can really help decentralize this and th this stuff is happening. It's just happening in lots of places, but it's not well organized or understood. And I think one way we might be a little helpful is in helping organize and understand it. And Klaus, maybe that's a, this is a, a bend or a, an angle to put on the Neo book that we're writing on Mondays. If anybody would like to join us, uh, Stuart and Klaus and I are having a lovely time talking about sort of the, the Neo books and the, the, the quick first book that we're working on is Klaus's creation alongside a collaboration partner known as ChatGPT um, and writing about uh, how how we might manage some of these things. So so this this might be a, a thing to think about in, in the context of the of the Neo book. But I'm interested in, in us maybe focusing on these kinds of things. And if anybody wants to find someone who's got <clears throat> a really nice framework and a great set of theories, uh, you know, there's there's donut economics out there. There's a there are a hundred things like donut economics that I've curated into my brain. Um, none of them yet has taken over the world the way uh, predatory capitalism ate the world over the last hundred years. And all of them, most of them, are trying to be the antidote to predatory capitalism because they have all got really all start with really good critiques of capitalism and look how it's breaking things. Um, so trying to figure trying to figure some of those things out. Uh, Gil, there's a there's a, a neo book group on Mattermost, and there's a call in my Zoom every Monday at ten thirty Pacific. I'm going to check to make sure I've got the time right. <clears throat> um, Yes, we start at 10.30 Pacific, so you're welcome to, to join us. Jerry, in all your um, research and wanderings, have you come across um, anything that's, anyone who's really looking at, at um, all of the systems and how they link together? Um, you know, David Bohm used to talk about, you know, when you perturbate um, one thing, it's got impact or consequences. Have you... Have you seen anything like that? Um, yeah. So I've run into some huge thinkers. Um, they tend to then narrow and have a thesis or a focus that makes them seem like less integrative thinkers, you know, but but uh, uh, Hunter and Amory Lovins both now separated, but but they're both really big thinkers. They, they think big picture. Um, uh, Saul Griffith says electrify everything. And, and he tries to take a monster big picture approach toward energy in the world and how that works. Um, uh, there's sort of a bunch of other people who take uh, large scale systems swipes at this. And I, I would have to sort of, uh, and, and you're, you're provoking me to go look at the collections of people like this that I've, that I've got and see who, you know, who would I recommend? Um, and happy to hear from anybody else who you think the, the best sort of uh, the best thinkers on this way are. I'd wager that the Chinese central committee is doing that as well. Yeah. Uh, Little, little known in the West, but China adopted you know, three or four or five year plans ago, a commitment to an ecological civilization, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, what we might think of China currently aside is kind of a remarkable document if people dive in and read that. And it's an attempt to both come. There are a lot of people who do big, complex system maps of connecting everything to everything, but translating that into effective action. Um, you know, on the spectrum of all the way to what Doug C is talking about is pretty rare. Um, so um, uh, I know we're close to time. So I want to respond um, in particular, Jerry, to some of the things that you were just saying. Um, water and soil is the heart of the story. Um, what you say when you talk about water and soil is you're talking about the basis of all life everywhere, simply put. Uh, so that's how important it is. Uh, you said soil fertility not as the core focus, but as the side effect. I think that's backwards. I think soil fertility is the core focus. Food production is the side effect. Wendell Berry used to talk about that the that the culture of agriculture was to was to cultivate soil and human community and by the way produce food. We go at it as let's produce food and everything else is a side effect. 
So there's some food for thought. Um, um, you, uh, you wondered about the pace of the conversation. Uh, maybe we need more beavers. Mm, I like <laughs> and if I could share screen for just a moment. I like that. Go for it. Um, uh, my, my friend and former partner, Bill Reed from Regenesis in uh, New Mexico has uh, been one of the leaders in this, in the regenerative work for a long time. And re regen the organization is Regenesis and their, their approach to doing development projects um, in, uh, with communities on land is to ask the question of what does this land want to be? And they spend a lot of time just hanging out, walking the land, trying to get a feel for what the native expression of that place is. And here's one example from a talk he and I did at SRI in the Rockies years ago. Uh, this was some very arid land in the American Southwest. Uh, um, scrub, you can see scrub, um, um, no water. And what they did was start to build some check dams, like you see here, the stones on the screen to slow the flow of the limited water. They actually, they, they, they came on this because they drilled cores in this very arid land and found that 10 feet down, there was indication of rich organic matter um, and a prior rich uh, biological life. Um, so they built check jams and did a number of other things and wound up with open flowing water year round, growth of vegetation. Um, Ken has told us the story about the person who walks upstream and, and uh, and, and puts a pebble in one place in a stream to change the course of the water downstream. So there's very small actions that can have very profound effects. Um, I mean, sorry, I got to take this down so I can see my notes. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, I think a lot of what we're talking about here is how we becomes we. Um, there are, um, you know, I mean, you know, Ken Ken planted this burr in my saddle last year, and it just will not it will not let me go to mix metaphors very badly. Uh, but the the many ways that we talk about we seems a very important piece here, and a lot of what we're talking about is the we that initiates new action, putting down the pebble. Ray Anderson's MO Ray, Ray's Ray's theory of change was to do this work at Interface and then share it as widely as he could. He spent the last 10 or 15 year, years of his life just flying around meeting with every CEO he could meet with to say, here's what we've done and here's how it's worked. And isn't this attractive? And you might want to try it uh, through, you know, through the, the propagation by example of, gee, that's interesting. Maybe that could be cool. And so... Um, you know, so the question of how how the limited we the the, the you know the, the thousands or millions of circles around the world like us who are having these conversations um, and how that spreads and propagates uh, and infects not just other communities but legislatures and boardrooms and so forth um, when some of the we are attached to a very limited notion of what we is so it's a question of how norms change uh, and how expectations change and how people's sense of what's possible changes and how people's sense of what they want and demand changes. Um, and that's the other way that I think that, that the big decisions happen is, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's the Klaatu, Baratu, and Niktu. Um, and, or there is the, just um, uh, the norms are different. Uh, the, the story I keep going back to, because it was one that I, you know, experienced in my lifetime, was growing up in a world where drinking and driving was cool, and being able to hold your liquor and not fall down was cool and macho and da 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 da. And when a bunch of mothers got together whose daughters had been killed by drunk drivers and created Mothers Against Drunk Driving and mounted a national campaign to shift the norms and make it not cool, but, you know, distasteful and horrible. And, you know, drunk driving still happens and we still have laws against it and people still die from it. But it's no longer cool in most parts of the culture. It's uh, it's shunned and there, you know, and bartenders will take people's keys and the norms changed. And in that case, it didn't happen from top down. It happened from bottom up. We're going to need both. But, you know, I, I'm I'm sure I'm coming away from this call with the question of how does we become we. Thank you, Gail. 
we are at the end of our time. Um, Ken, do you have a poetic thing to throw in? I do, but I noticed Carl had his hand up and then took it down. Did you want to say something, Carl? Thank you. I, I just wanted to say also in response to Gil, um, great spiritual teacher who was a former internist, uh, whose name all of a sudden I, I just blanked on, wrote a wonderful book, uh, Richard Moss, M-O-S-S, -S, The Eye That Is We, The Eye That Is We, which I need to go back and and and, and reread. A great book. Scripper, I studied with Richard. He's a remarkable teacher. So did I, so did I Gil. <laughs> uh, Carl, please. Yeah, I'm not sure if I did <laughs> say anything. Well, I mean, the, there were some people they went to um, from GSA. They had gone to China as an uh, advance visit to um, when Obama was going there. They got taken on a tour. China built an entire city for 10 million people, complete IPV infrastructure, high-speed rail, rail coming in, um, network, all this stuff. Then we started seeing an article about things were starting to collapse. And it's, I think they were actually doing an experiment to see how fast they could build a city like that. They had no intention of anyone ever living there and stuff. That's that's crazy. I mean, how much concrete is, is kind of using is um, one thing. And then the other thing is my pet peeve with, with the whole climate science people is they're staying in the denier frame, human caused climate change is not is the is the issue we don't need to be bringing that up we should eliminate that qualifier it's about the science it's about taking collective action and focus on the science when you blame humans that just reinforces the deniers in saying that they you know i mean it's just so, I mean, it's just, it's really frustrating. I, I don't know how many groups I post Monty Python's argument clinic to, but it really needs to be considered uh, that we need to focus on the science. It's the collective actions that we need to be taking and not getting out of this blame game because there's not, we can't go back and change the industrialization from World War II, which has caused the issue, but it does at this point does we got all the CO2 and stuff. It doesn't really matter how it got there. That's a pass, it's sunk cost. We need to get to solutions. Uh, that's my rant for the day. Well, with that passionate commentary, we'll go to Ken for a poem to take us out. Thanks, Carl. You appreciate the passion, Carl, and I share it. So I hear you. So I think we'll turn to Mary Oliver today. <clears throat> and since we've been talking about water and land, um, and Turtle Island is a, a name that many indigenous people have for North America, we'll go to the turtle. The turtle breaks from the blue-black skin of the water, dragging her shell with its mossy scoots across the shallows and through the rushes and over the mudflats to the uprise to the yellow sand, to dig with her ungainly feet a nest, and hunker there spewing her white eggs down into the darkness. And you think of her patience, her fortitude, her determination to complete what she was born to do. And then you realize a greater thing. She doesn't consider what she was born to do. She's only filled with an old blind wish it isn't even hers, but came to her in the rain or the soft wind, which is a gate through which her life keeps walking. She can't see herself apart from the rest of the world or a world from what she must do every spring. Crawling up the high hill, luminous under the sand that has packed against her skin, she doesn't dream. She knows. She is a part of the pond she lives in. The tall trees are her children. The birds that swim above her are tied to her 
by an unbreakable string. Thank you very much. See everybody next week for a check-in-ish call. And then in two weeks, we'll pick this theme back up and head back in. Thanks, everybody. Ciao. Go be a beaver. <laughs>